Socrates was born in Pará, but grew up in Ribeira Prieto, a city in the northwest of Sao Paulo state, Brazil's most developed economy. His father grew up poor, but was self-taught and insisted that all his sons study hard. Ever since he was a boy, Socrates dreamt of being a doctor, and he would study by day and at night and at the weekends train or play for Botafogo, one of the two big clubs in Ribeiro. When he graduated, he was faced with a choice of medicine or football, and he chose the latter, because, as his father insisted, he could practice medicine when he finished playing football, but he couldn't do it the other way around. Brazil in the 1970s was run by brutal military dictators, but the young Socrates was apolitical. In addition to books and back heels, his main interests were drinking, smoking, and chasing girls. What little he did know was tainted by the conservative culture of Ribeira Preto and the regime's rigid control. In one of his first interviews in 1976, Socrates supported the dictatorship and said censorship was important if a government was to maintain control of its people. Of course, they were words that he would later disavow. Socrates had always been aware of Brazil's brutal inequality. As a footballer, he saw it up close in his teammates, many of whom were poor, dark-skinned and uneducated. He encouraged them to read, often by simply leaving a newspaper lying about the team hotel. No one picked it up, he recalled, ever. I said to them, you need to learn, keep up with things, grow as people. Socrates' true political awakening came in Sao Paulo after joining Corinthians in 1978. Corinthians was the biggest club in the biggest city in Brazil and a star player there was in demand. Socrates met and befriended the country's top journalists, celebrities, politicians, musicians and intellectuals. And it was at Corinthians that he first met Vladimir, the Afro-Brazilian fullback who was one of Brazil's earliest and most visible proponents of black power. He soon became friends with Juca Kafuri, a leftist sociologist who was the editor of Placar, the influential and big-selling sports magazine. But his biggest influence was Adelson Monteiro Alves, who took over as Corinthians' director of football in 1981. A staunch socialist who used to manage a biscuit factory, Adelson became Socrates' political mentor. They became firm friends and drinking partners, and together they were the driving force behind what became known as Democracia Corinthiana. Along with Vladimir, veteran defender Zimaria, and then striker Walter Casagrande, they formed what was the most radical player power movement that football has ever seen. Everyone at the club got a vote, and the president had as much power as the tea lady over club issues. On the playing side, the squad voted on everything that affected the team, how long to train, if their priority was to sign a, a new left winger or a new centre forward, even whether to stop the team coach so that everyone could run to the toilet. The movement was controversial, Brazil's vested interests hated seeing a bunch of ragtag footballers challenging their authority, but it was also a success. It brought, by example, the message of free speech and democracy, of one person, one vote, to millions of Brazilians who'd known only repression. And people who would never listen to the president listened to Socrates. We were poking the bear with a short stick, he said, and it was beautiful, because we took it beyond our own horizons to the horizons of the nation, and that is what we wanted to do. The man they affectionately call the doctor reveled in the spotlight. When he was asked about the World Cup or the Paulista State Championship, he would answer politely and then change the subject to talk about the need for better schools or greater investment in hospitals. Now, not all of his Corinthians teammates supported the idea, but most went along with it, and coincidentally perhaps, it coincided with a great spell for the club. Corinthians did not win a trophy between 54 and 77, when they laid their hoodoo by winning the Paulista State Championship. Socrates arrived in 1978, and they won the title again a year later. Under Democracia Corinthiana, they won the Paulista two years running in 82 and 83, the first time they'd won back-to-back -back titles in more than 30 years. And as they walked onto the field for the second leg of the final in December 1983, the Corinthian players carried a banner that declared, win or lose, but always with democracy. It was one of the most iconic moments in Brazilian footballing history. Off the field, his involvement in politics and social campaigns energised Socrates more than football. The dictators had been in power for almost 20 years, and with the economy tanking, they knew that their days were numbered. Socrates' outspoken opposition helped hasten their demise. And key to that was his support for the Duretasia movement that in early 1984 fought for the return of democratic elections for president. Huge demonstrations took place all over Brazil. 
In Sao Paulo, more than a million people turned out to hear Socrates, backed up by several of his Corinthians teammates, appeal for a return to free and fair ballots. At precisely the same time, Socrates was in demand with Europe's top clubs. His starring performances as Brazil captain in the 1982 World Cup prompted big money offers from across the Atlantic. The best players in the world were moving to Spain, and particularly Italy, and Socrates was keen on testing himself. But he was so committed to the democratic cause, and so enthralled to the idea that the nation he loved must develop its own kind of tropical socialism, that he promised the huge crowd if the military-backed Congress voted to allow free and fair elections, he would reject the lure of the lira and stay in Brazil to help with the transition to democracy. The measure was rejected, and soon after, Socrates signed for Fiorentina. <laughs> 